Hi guys, welcome to Classic Cars Driven by Data. In this episode, we're gonna take a look at this beautiful 1958 MGA. We're gonna take a walk around, we're gonna look at all the upgrades that it's had over the years, from the powertrain to the brakes, to the dash, to the steering wheel, and a lot of other details in between. So uh, strap in and I hope you enjoy this episode. So we just took a look at the 60 spoke uh, wheels and the disc brake. Um, let's see a close up there. Beautiful, beautiful wheels. I must say I much prefer them to the uh, Dunlop wheels, the solid steel version. Um, we've got the tonneau cover on today, which we'll, uh, we'll remove in a minute and we'll take a look at the dash and have a look inside the car. Maybe we'll pop the hood. Uh, pop the trunk and let you take a look at that. But looking at the back of the car, again, beautiful lines. Um, little single exhaust at the back. Uh, we'll talk about the powertrain in a minute. And as you come round, you'll see the, uh, it's got a little luggage rack on the back, which I actually think is, is quite nice. You see the, uh, the fender or the bumper as they call it in the UK. And then the tail lights, which obviously act as uh, brake lights as well. They've actually been upfit with uh, LEDs, as have most of the bulbs on this vehicle. The dash bulbs, uh, LEDs, and so we're pretty much able to read the speedo and the rev counter at night when things are dark. So let's take a look at the VIN number for this uh, particular 1958 MGA. It's HDT 4341882. So what does that what does that tell us about the car? Well, first of all, the H is simply uh, an indicator that it's an MGA. The D tells us it's a roadster with an open cockpit as opposed to a coupe. The T is the color and at bottom right you can see tyrolite green and that was the original color of this car i've uh, poked around in the trunk and uh, under the hood and there are tiny little patches that are in fact tyrolite green the four indicates uh, left-hand drive for the north american market and sure enough it's left-hand drive the three is the type of paint that was used not sure why they needed to tell us that but they did and then finally 41,882 is in fact the serial number. So this tells us when it was built. It was built between January 57 and January 58 and probably built around about October 1957, which lines it up perfectly with the 1958 uh, model year. Let's take a look under hood. In the uh, right in the middle there, you see the four-cylinder BMC B series engine. In this case, it's 1800 cc displacement, taken from an MGB at some point. I'm happy to say, and all the ancillaries around that 1800 cc engine, for the most part, as far as I can tell, are in fact uh, the original MGA parts. So there's. I think the long block 1800 cc engine was dropped in here and everything else to the extent possible was maintained. In terms of specifications, so we've got the 1800 cc MGB engine with the five bearing crank, early 70s is uh, the best estimate I've got based on the uh, information that's on the, on the uh, engine block, nominally 95 horsepower, Maximum engine speed about 5,500 RPM, give or take. And uh, I personally prefer to operate in the 2.5 to 4,000 rev range. Peak torque is about 3,500 RPM. So she performs really well once you get above 2,500, 3,000 RPM. Lots of acceleration, uh, 40 to 60 times, very comfortable, very nice. And you can drive it on the interstate or the motorway and not feel too badly about uh, how you're doing relative to uh, other vehicles. It's got twin H4 type SU carbs, um, inch and a half diameter throat, just the same as the original MGB would have required. Uh, it had a different series. I think it had HS4, 
the four indicates the throat diameter. And so I'm, I'm content that these two carbs are going to do an adequate job. And in a later episode, we're going to be looking at tuning those carbs with an air fuel ratio, oxygen sensor, as well as traditional methods. So this uh, car has got a five speed manual. The fifth gear is in fact overdrive. The fourth gear is uh, straight through one to one. So on the interstate or the motorway at 70 miles an hour, the engine's turning at about 3,500 RPM, which is reasonably comfortable. I'm not sure I'd want to do three or 400 miles, but certainly hopping on and off the interstate, not at all a problem. It's got electronic points, which I like. It's got a cool air intake system that uh, I fitted, and it's got a seven bladed uh, cooling fan. Just another view here. Um, you see the detail on the carbs, the MG uh, details, and on the valve cover, which is uh, which is super nice. I like that. And a view from the left side of the engine. You see the data plate on the left that tells us the serial number, the VIN number, so to speak, HDT forty three. 41882, you see the ignition coil, and you can just about see the top of the distributor. Here's a close up of the cool air intake. So, at the top of the picture, the manifold in, in dark gray there is from Moss Motors Incorporated, and it replaces the two filters. Um, I've got good reason for wanting to do that. I, I, I'm a firm believer that. Most engines appreciate the coldest air that they can be given. Uh, I live in Southern California, so we, we never really get freezing temperatures. So a slight uh, warning there that, uh, yeah, yeah, if you're in Minnesota or Canada, you may not want to do this unless you've got some other way of warming the air in the winter time, because, uh, you know, at, at minus 10 Celsius, you might not want to be putting that air into the engine, but in, certainly in Southern California, this is a this is a win-win. It's good for fuel octane. It prevents knocking under load, uh, prevents engine damage. It reduces the thermal load on the engine, and uh, the real bonus is that it lifts the torque curve by about five percent because the air going into the engine is more dense by about five, actually five to eight percent. So. Um, it's a win-win, and on, certainly on this vehicle, it seems to work really well. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, engine fitted in this MGA. As I said earlier, it's actually been upgraded to a 1.8 or 1800 cc MGB engine from, from the early 70s. Let's take a quick look at the torque and power curves for the uh, MGB engine that's in this MGA. So here's the torque curve. So maximum torque is approximately 150 newton meters or 111 foot pounds. It's got a really nice wide torque range. You notice all the way from 2000 to 5000 RPM. And really that's the range in which you wanna be doing your shifting if you want maximum acceleration. It's worth remembering that approximately torque equals acceleration. And so the higher the torque we can access, the better the acceleration is going to be in general terms. Let's look at the power curve. So here's the power curve, and you notice that power peaks at oh, 5,500 RPM. So power is really not so much about acceleration, although it is directly related to torque. It's more about the maximum speed that you can get out of the vehicle, and I'll show you where I think uh, that plays out for this particular vehicle, what the top speed is in top gear relative to this power curve. So the max power is 95 horsepower. That's, what is that? That's about 62 kilowatts. And it occurs at 5,500 RPM, as I've said. So once again, this is the 1800 cc MGB engine that's now installed in this MGA. So the good news also for, uh, for this vehicle is that it's been upgraded with a five-speed transmission from Vitesse. It's uh, a Mazda MX-5 transmission. The top uh, ratio is, um, well, I'm gonna show you the top ratio. Let's, let's do that now. 
So looking at the data at the top right, so the vehicle is an MGA Mark I originally with a 1500cc engine, and now it's uh, got a 1800cc um, MGB engine and the Mazda 5-speed conversion. The real, rear wheel final drive differential ratio is 4.3. And then you can see the ratios for the five gears, uh, with the fifth gear being less than one, which which basically means it's an overdrive. So um, in the chart, what I show is the five gears, and I'm showing engine speed versus vehicle speed. So you can see that in theory, uh, if the power was available, you could do over 100 miles an hour in fifth gear overdrive. And you'd still only be turning the engine at 5,000 RPM. I have no intention of doing that. <laughs> I've never been there. Uh, and I'll show you roughly where I think the maximum speed is for this uh, vehicle. So, so there are the, there are the gears, and that's the relationship between engine speed and vehicle speed in each of the gears. Let's show you where I tend to drive. So this is this is where I drive. I pretty much shift at 3,500 RPM in first, maybe even 3,000 RPM in first, and then in second, that takes me from about uh, 20, a little under 20 miles an hour up to well about 35 miles an hour, 3,800 RPM, and then I shift again. And you can see the the shift pattern. And you'll see um, that fifth gear. Again, it shows over 100 miles an hour in fifth at 5,000 RPM, although I've never been there, and I'm pretty confident that there isn't enough power in this 1800cc engine to do that. Although, if you have other data, by all means, leave a comment below. We'd be happy to see that. So let's take a look at maximum speed. I estimate that the maximum speed on level ground, I would add, is about 85 miles an hour and so in fifth gear uh, the engine would be turning at about 4000 rpm so let's talk about the dash um, the dash is another aftermarket not installed by me but by a previous owner by the way i don't have any pedigree, provenance, history, anything at all to do with this car. I'm having to try to figure out what happened to it over the years as different pieces were changed, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, anyway, I'm glad they did it. This dash is beautiful. The, when made, it would have been a sheet metal dash painted the original color, which, believe it or not, was in fact tyrolite green, which is not my favorite green. So I'm, I'm happy that they replaced it with this wood veneer. So on the left, you'll see the uh, indicator uh, or traffic signal, I should say. In the UK, we'd probably say indicator. But in the US, it's a turn signal. Um, next to the turn signal is the speedometer and the odometer and the trip. So it's quite nice. It actually has a trip mileage as well. Rev counter next to that, you can see that the Red line is at 5,500 RPM, I think. Uh, or at least I'm not going to go anywhere near it as I drive it. I tend to, if I'm being aggressive, I shift at about 4,000 RPM. We'll talk about the gearbox in a minute and the ratios and uh, etc. Next to the uh, rev counter is the combined coolant temperature and oil pressure. I'm happy to say that oil pressure is good. I get typically 60 PSI. If the oil is a little cool, I get 80 PSI. Or if I'm turning, if we're revving at uh, 4,000 RPM, I'll get about 80 PSI. So I'm pretty happy with that. Coolant temperature, the radiator seems to do a great job. I've been out driving in, uh, you know, 28 Celsius, um, high 80s, low 90s Fahrenheit and not a problem at all the cooling the cooling is amazing so i if anything i think the uh, the fan and radiator combination they're doing a great job uh, i'm happy that maybe they're a little over capacity that's basically what you'd want in this climate here in southern california next to that you'll see i've installed a little clock i um easily 
uh, removed later. If, if the next owner wants to get rid of the clock, they can easily get that uh, screen here that uh, where the speaker for the radio would normally sit. And next to that, you'll see the um, ignition switch or the key switch. Uh, that doesn't start the vehicle. If you turn the key, it, it starts the lift pump, the fuel lift pump running, and it, it lights up the whole system electrically. But then you've got to pull the starter knob here, which I'll demonstrate shortly, to start the engine. Then we've got a fuel gauge. I don't really trust the fuel gauge. Once it gets a little bit below half full, I tend to top it up and keep it running between full and a little below half. Um, a unique feature, um, it wasn't factory installed, as you can imagine, is the USB outlet here. So it's a double, um, just found that on uh, Amazon, I think it was, and uh, got it within a couple days, and it took me 15 minutes to install it. But, it, you know, it means that I can have GPS on my phone, I can have Bluetooth music on my phone. I've got a little Bluetooth speaker here, $10 from Target. Um, and if somebody else wants to be charging their phone or doing something else, then we've, we've got another outlet here. The radio used to be here. I've still got it. So if, again, when the car moves on to the next owner, all those original pieces are available. And then finally, on the right-hand side, you'll see the map light. So I guess back in the day, uh, if you wanted to go anywhere and know where you were going, you had a map, a book of maps, and you did your best to kind of follow it. Um, so if you're driving at night, you need a little light in order to see that. It's not a situation I'm fond of, so I'm, I'm happy to have the iPhone GPS. So let's take a look at the trunk. First of all, there's this uh, nice chrome luggage rack on the back, and you know maybe one day I'll obtain a nice leather suitcase that I can put on there, but uh, in the meantime it still looks uh, still looks pretty good. The trunk itself is not very roomy and when you've got a spare wheel in there, uh, even less room. But notice the copper hammer for knockoffs, the, uh, the jack, but the nice wooden template there that can go around the knockoff and give you one a little bit of extra leverage and two you don't have to hit the knockoffs uh, with that copper hammer. So, um, but I'm thrilled that the spare is in fact the full 60 spoke wheel in really good condition. Uh, not to mention the tire uh, being in good condition too. So uh, really pleased with that. Well, that concludes this episode of Classic Cars Driven by Data where we looked at this beautiful 1958 MGA. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button below and we will notify you of upcoming editions.